and published last December. And um, today we're going to talk, uh, here are the chapters of my book, just to start out. So uh, the name of the book is Millennial Expats in China, Experiences and Observations. And the first part we're gonna talk about um, today, which will be the personal experiences. Um, as you can see, we have, um, you know, quite a number of chapters and the aim is to create a an overall relatively comprehensive view of China for people who have never been there um, and to give them a, a good uh, head start in the event that they want to go there or especially if family members go because I know that there are plenty of people who have uh, a lot of concerns. A lot of family members have concerns before their kids go there. So with them in mind, especially, and with future sojourners, I put together this book. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the participants in the study. We're going to talk about impressions. We're going to talk about the impressions they had before going there, their very first impressions, and then their changing uh, impressions or the impressions that they had developed over time. So with that in mind, let's start with the participant demographics so that we know who we're talking about. Uh, first of all, uh, the people in the in this study were all um, were all millennials, meaning that they were generally born between 1980 and 1995. And so if we look at the 20 millennials that uh, took part in this study, you'll see that there's a pretty good distribution by age, right? We have five people be between 25 and 27, seven people between 29 and 31, five between 33 and 36, and three between 37 and 41. If we look at race, we notice of the 20, we have 12 who were white, two who identified as Latino, uh, five as black or African-American, included a Caribbean uh, student, and uh, one as Asian. And I can't say for sure because statistics are not available, but my guess is that this, as well as the gender, are probably pretty representative of the North Americans in China. Uh, next, by gender, there are probably about twice as many men as women. And again, while I don't have statistics available through the, any of the Chinese ministries, most people I spoke to informally, both Chinese and, uh, and foreign, uh, claim that there are probably at least twice as many men as women, uh, foreigners. And by major, overwhelmingly students were humanities majors, often in, the, in Asian studies or in social sciences um, and other humanities, even music and um, I think history and relatively few had majored in the science. And those who had studied computer science or environmental science. Okay. Uh, the participants in the study, years in China. So you'll see that uh, 10 of the, half of the participants were there between four and six years. Uh, six of them had been there for less than two years, but generally 18 months at least. And four of them had been there between seven and 11 years. This was as of April 1st, 2020. And as in terms of self-reported Chinese ability, and a lot of this has to do with uh, acquired Asian modesty, uh, I think some of them rated themselves a bit low, but um, you can see there's a relatively fair distribution, although a few did not speak Chinese very well at all. Um, and this one I thought was interesting because I really felt as I was speaking to my different participants that they were very different personality-wise. And when I asked them to rate themselves on a scale of one to 10, in terms of how introverted or extroverted they consider themselves, you'll see that we have quite a distribution. We have a few extreme extroverts, a few introverts, and a number of people who found themselves somewhere in the middle. And uh, for those who are um, academics, I need to point out that I used grounded theory for this, meaning I didn't come in with any particular lens. Um, I provided open-ended questions. I looked at the uh, answers, and I, based on the, the answers that I saw, I created codes and subcategories and then made some analysis and came up with a theory. Okay. All right, today's chapter, since we're talking about impressions, who better to uh, use than Vincent van Gogh's impressionism? Um, and so the three chapters, as mentioned, will be prior impressions, first impressions, and changing impressions. Um, 
Under prior impressions, what did they think of China before they got there? I found three major categories. The first was informed but skewed ideas. The second one was misguided ideas. And the third was absolutely no idea at all. So first of all, under the uh, informed but skewed ideas, uh, here's a quote from uh, one of the students who said, I had, taken uh, I had taken Chinese courses before I ever went to China. So I had this really good impression because obviously the teachers were mostly from China. And so they weren't exactly talking about any, any of the bad parts, of course. And I knew like most Americans, that lots of the items that we buy every day are made in, made in China and that those items are maybe not made in the best conditions. I'm sure I was aware that a lot of the country's population was at a much lower living standard than the US but I think I had mostly good impressions because I hadn't gotten to focus on the culture aspect. The teachers didn't really talk about economic impacts or anything like that, so I learned the language and had a great impression. I really liked all my teachers, and so I had a very good impression, okay? So in case you are feeling, why didn't, uh, why was this such a, a, a prejudiced, um, impression of China that was provided by the uh, the Chinese professors and others, um, I have to ask who leads with negative aspects? Um, who says, my name is George, I'm unemployed and live with my parents, right? Um, that's usually not the first thing that we say about ourselves. Um, likewise, when we tell the story of George Washington, we usually uh, don't start with the fact that he, he died with 317 slaves. And while they say that he um, freed the slaves after he, in his will, only one was freed immediately, the other 316 upon Martha's death. Um, and every Martha realizing that she stood between 316 slaves and their freedoms, freed them the next year. Now, these are things that we don't learn in class. In fact, I learned this uh, this morning as I looked it up. Um, so in the event that anybody's wondering why don't Chinese represent more of the negative aspects of China. Well, let's throw it back in our own faces, right? Um, the 1619 project is banned in many schools and we see more and more book banning. So maybe the, that's, uh, maybe we need to look at ourselves in some respects. Um, so I, what I'm saying is it's relatively understandable that uh, Chinese who come here might represent more of the positive aspects of their culture. OK, so I'm going to get off of my soapbox and my humble opinion. OK. Now, the second th uh, prior impression was oppo opposing skewed impressions. Um, someone said, I had on the one hand all the people in my immediate family and community telling me like, oh, this is a third world, unsafe, strange place. And then I also had people in my school uh, community telling me that, oh, no, this is an exciting, fun place with a lot going for it. So I think the combination of those two things was my impression going. And I have to say, um, not that I'm providing continual defense for China, but I have never felt unsafe. Um, I would say it is an extremely safe country. Um, you're hard pressed to find anyone with a gun um, or see violence on the street or anything, or even feel unsafe at three in the morning. Um, the second was misguided ideas, um, ideas that were not even skewed, but just completely off. So one student said, I probably watched a lot of Kung Fu movies, a lot of, say, Travel Channel, where a lot of times they'll show the rickshaws and then show traditional music and all this stuff. So I was thinking, OK, I'm going to see rickshaws. I'm going to see the Gujongs um, everywhere, and it will be like very old style China. OK, well, I can tell you that China has, uh, is very much in the 21st century. Um, and so you're not likely to see uh, Bruce Lee running around the streets and uh, beating people up or, or rickshaws and zithers everywhere. Although you will hear a lot of zither music in hotels. Another misguided idea is that it's like North Korea, okay? A lot of older Chinese people that I know will admit that um, North Korea is probably very much like China was in the 1950s and even the 1960s. And while there is certainly censorship and oppression, unlike North Korea, Chinese have been traveling all over the world. They're certainly bringing new ideas, um, you know, or, or learning new ideas. Uh, people are coming and going in China as they will. Um, it is economically becoming more and more prosperous. So the comparison with North 
Korea is, is a complete fallacy. Okay. Another common misconception, and one I had myself, was that it's like Japan. Okay. Um, it is 180 degrees in the opposite direction of Japan. And if I had to put it into a very succinct explanation, I would use um, Hofstede's um, uncertainty avoidance value. And that is to say that the Japanese tend to avoid all uncertainty. They tend to have lots and lots of rules so that they will feel comfortable in various situations. The Chinese are much more like the Americans. They're a little bit more adventurous. They are, um, they're not bound by rules. If there is a rule where the Japanese would, uh, would bow back and say, uh, there's a rule, uh, we can't do this. The Chinese will often circumvent rules, okay? I'm sure they wouldn't like to hear me say that, but it's, uh, it's a fact. All right, um, so if I wanted to, in broad stroke, say what is the difference between China and Japan, um, and understand that this is meant to be with humor and in very broad strokes and not so extreme, but I would say in China, nothing matters. In Japan, everything matters. So when I say that, I'm saying that the Chinese are very forgiving. They're not extremely rule bound. They're much more casual. And the Japanese, as you can see, have rules for bowing. They have all kinds of rules for, for eating, um, for removing shoes and changing shoes in different rooms. Um, so in that respect, the Chinese and the Japanese are extremely different. One loves rules, the other one relatively uh, minimizes rules. Um, the third uh, thing I found from in terms of prior impressions was people who had absolutely no idea at all, who just basically went there without learning anything um, about China. Someone said, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't do any research. I wanted like a big surprise, okay? And just the thrill of that is the excitement of taking the plunge, right? I'm going to someplace new and I know I'm going to survive. Other people have survived before me. I know that I can survive and this is going to be great. So a good number of people that I um, spoke with, even those who had studied China before, were just happy to go and figure it all out. Okay, and having gone to Japan when I was 22, I can completely understand that. Um, chapter three, first impressions. Now, the reason I put this background is here is what I realized in retrospect with, was that a lot of the first impressions, as you might expect, are surface, they're surface level, right? And so what we're going to see is people's reactions to crowds, uh, what they perceived as chaos, um, the plethora of convenient transportation, that's also a bit harrowing at times, differences in sanitation, and some felt welcomed and some did not feel so welcomed. So first of all, crowds, the first thing people say, wow, I can't believe all the people. People, lots and lots of people. Uh, the Chinese have a saying that is uh, ren shan, ren hai, um, which is people mountain, people sea, meaning people everywhere. Um, if you have been to Tokyo or Buenos Aires or, or Mexico City, you probably won't find even Beijing that crowded. Although compared to basically any city in America, um, China does tend to be fairly crowded. So yes, there are a lot more people than you are going to find anywhere in the Midwest. Next was chaos, okay? At least that was the perception in terms of traffic, in terms of what happens when you go to the bank, in terms of, you know, whatever bureaucratic institution. So one of the quotes I had was, a lot of people bustling. Yeah, just chaos kind of. And that's about it. I don't know how else to describe it in big, big terms, unorganized. Definitely, I got that impression at the start, and I still have that impression in a lot of ways, okay? Um, so this came up quite a bit, um, but on a more philosophical um, note, a student who had studied in a, uh, for a doctorate in, or I'm sorry, for a master's in philosophy in Chinese um, in Shanghai had this to say. I think nowadays most Chinese view chaos as we do in the West, bad, wild, unorganized. But instead of wanting or demanding structure, they see chaos in these instances as unchanging or just the way it is because it's the 
may bamfa, it, it can't be helped lifestyle. So Chinese don't act out against it, they accept it. Okay, so it's a very, very Taoist go with the flow sort of uh, mentality. Once you've lived in China, this is something that people began to realize and accept themselves. Um, next, convenient transportation. In China, there, there are 24 flights a day from Wuhan to Beijing. Um, there are trains going every which direction. I, uh, there are these little golf carts here on college campuses that will take you from campus, from one place on campus to another. High-speed railways uh, that go about 150 miles an hour. You'll find these rent-a-bikes like the Mogo we have here in Detroit. Um, you'll find subways, you'll find trains, you'll find buses. There are ways to get around in China. Um, going by your personal car can be a little bit uh, vexing, but there are plenty of other ways to travel in China. And their airports are amazing, um, far ahead of ours. Harrowing transportation. This was something that uh, a student said that was emblematic of, of what I'd heard from many people. He said, oh. well, first off, we took a taxi into the university and the taxi is just weaving in and out of traffic. And I was like, what is going on? And then I eventually realized this must just be how they do it. So after about three minutes, I just kind of sat back in the back of my seat and then just relaxed. Um, I think three minutes is probably an exaggeration, but um, I think every first timer going into a taxi can hardly believe that the taxi driver isn't hitting people and that people can lackadaisically be walking in front of the taxi and weaving in and out on bikes. Um, and in the countryside, you'll see farm animals and chickens. Um, my hat is off to Chinese drivers. Um, this came from a student who was married to a Chinese national and lived in China for about five years. And I thought this was interesting, though I can't uh, give a scientific stamp of approval. He said, what I realized eventually is Chinese all belong to the same hive mind. What seems imperceptible to outsiders is innately understood and then questioned within the system. I'm convinced they telepathically communicate with one another and laughs. Um, I can attest to riding a bicycle through very crowded streets in Beijing and everyone just getting out of my way without saying anything, without looking at me. It was just, they were just naturally predisposed to getting out of the way of other people. The only thing I will caution is never back up, never step backwards in China or you will bump into someone. But if you are going forward and everybody else is going forward, there seems to be some kind of system worked out. Um, other observations, first impressions, differences in sanitation. And so what I did was, was I gathered two different quotes, one from a millennial and one from a boomer, okay? And uh, they had slightly different things to say. The millennial said, to, uh, to be quite frank, I was shocked at how dirty some things were compared to the US. I was overwhelmed by the pollution and just the lack of sanitation in some areas, right? Not everywhere. I guess that would be a good way to put it. And the boomer, um, a professor of uh, Chinese somewhere, said, my first trip was 1978 and the skies were blue through the 1980s, as I remember. Of course, it was truly a developing country back then, so things were simpler and there weren't so many sanitation systems in place then. Uh, plus, population, while large, wasn't so huge as now, 40 years later. High rises were very few and far between, as were cars and stores and consumerism, so again, there was less waste being produced. So it's a mixed comparison, okay? And then finally, among the first impressions were people who felt welcomed and others who did not feel so welcomed. And then we'll, we'll talk about later how some of these people fared um, a couple of, of years on. Uh, in terms of welcoming, a, um, an athlete from Minnesota said, just like amazing, such friendly people. Our language skills weren't that great at that time, but they'd still appreciate our efforts. And then when my language skills grew, I could really connect with people. So I appreciated those times, like taxi drivers or all those small conversations where I just really got to understand deeply China. But at first, it was very surface level. But yeah, just the genuine heart of the Chinese people is really what was communicated.
Okay, so I found a number of people who, who really had a wonderful first experience. Um, conversely, uh, a, a young man from uh, Los Angeles had this to say. The moment we touch ground in Wuhan, we get bombarded by the black taxi drivers. Where are you going? Where are you going? And the Wuhanese accent is very aggressive. So I went from Beijing from being scared to landing in Wuhan and I was like, oh my God, this is overwhelming. I felt like people never stopped yelling at me. And as soon as we're walking, everyone is shouting at us, where are you going? We had this little card, right? And the card said on, on the top in English, show to taxi driver. And this is all in Chinese, couldn't read it. So we're just showing off our card and everyone's trying to give us a ride because everyone wants the fare. Finally, someone kind of pushed us toward the official taxi driver line, and that's where we ended up uh, getting the, in a taxi. So that was what my very initial react. So that was like my very initial reaction to the people. Okay. Now we'll get into chapter four. Finally, changing impressions. So I wasn't sure if I should call these developed impressions, um, but I realized that the impressions would change forever. And I was reminded of this uh, phrase by um, Heraclitus, uh, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. Okay. And keeping this in mind, I said, well, there, there really, I can divide this chapter into personal changes. The people were changing, but also China was changing at the same time. So over four or five years, the China that you saw in 2008 was not the same China that you saw in 2012 or in 2016 or in 2020, right? There are constantly changes, and so that is going to play upon your impression, right? So under personal changes, there was, of course, culture shock, language learning, um, understanding the bureaucracy made their uh, impressions change, understanding government as well, understanding the character and moods of the people, and understanding attitudes toward foreigners also shaped their impressions of China. And then there were the environmental changes. China, of course, is a dynamic country, uh, perhaps more dynamic than many. And so there was a dissolution of romantic notions, which was a little bit on the personal side. I wasn't sure how to um, classify it. Infrastructure, of course, was changing and growing the whole while. Censorship and surveillance, um, as we'll see, started to um, to go backward. I think things were relatively more open in 2008, 2009, and upon Xi Jinping's coming to power, um, we start to see more and more censorship and surveillance. And of course, the people were changing, okay? Um, as we'll see, people were becoming more confident in China, less humble in some ways. So let's talk about that. And you'll notice these little arrows that I have going back and forth. So the change is the person changing, but it's also the river changing in ways that changes the person. So first changes in personal perspective. Of course, in whenever we deal with culture shock, there's often that euphoria, there's shock, there's a transition, and then there's final acceptance. But I think a better way I use to explain it is when you find yourself in a very different area, whether you're in Japan, whether you're in China, whether you're in the country coming to the city, you're going to find things that you love and things that you hate. And when you first get there and you're first immersed, you really love things and you also really hate things. This really bothers me. Oh, I love this. And over time, it's like, I like this. I really don't like this. This is cool. I really would prefer not to do this. Oh, this is okay. This is not so okay. And over time, you may not get to zero, but your emotions are less heightened as you get used to um, wherever it is that you are, the new culture. So regarding culture shock, um, one of the uh, participants had this to say. So I think initially there was the shock, right? And that was the biggest thing. And it was hard to get anywhere beyond that in the beginning. Then after a while, you start to get used to it, right? So you stop noticing the environmental things and you start to pay attention to just what's going on. And I think it did change in some respects. For the first couple of years, I just focused on myself and on my studies, right? And so I think it was fun. I enjoyed it. Okay, and this came from the uh, 
the the young man from Los Angeles who actually has stake in or had stake in three bars in in Wuhan. And so after that first taxi ride, and he'd been in China, I think for eight years, he had this to say. Yeah, it totally changed. And if it didn't change, I don't think I would have been there for six years. It was just that initial culture shock, that language shock, the varying differences between what we were accustomed to. Something as simple as being able to ask for the bathroom became almost impossible, right? So that was very difficult. But once I got there, I was having the time of my life. Three days in, right? I was going out with buddies the first night I landed. So the impression changed dramatically and very quickly. But I'll never forget that initial impression, right? It was just something that got burned into my head. Uh, language learning, I have an entire chapter on language learning in my book, which is chapter six. I won't get into it um, deeply here, but uh, suffice it to say that as people learned Chinese, learned to speak Chinese, get around, order food, uh, use the transportation system, speak with the people, things changed, right? Their understanding, their appreciation for China changed with the language. And as we'll talk about later, sometimes as the language really got better, they had some negative um, impressions as well once they understood some of the, the things that they had missed uh, through their rose-colored glasses. Okay. Um, and here's a student who said, um, the feeling of chaos and inorganization and the bureaucracy kind of stuff of China, that was a constant throughout, up until now, in fact. But yeah, I felt close to the country and the people there at the end of my time there. So what happened is even though he felt the chaos wasn't changing, he began to change as he started to feel a part of it, as he felt that he belonged to that system somewhat and took ownership of it. So even if we don't live, for example, in the most beautiful city in the world, a lot of times just the fact that we belong to something, whether it's a dysfunctional family or a dysfunctional community, um, often we take ownership and feel that sense of belonging and perhaps we have more positive impressions after a while. Understanding government, and this was from a student who had studied law um, at Wuhan University, and he said, I think I developed some empathy and understanding for the Chinese government having studied law there. I learned how the system is supposed to work, talked to many Chinese and understood a little better how it actually works. And somewhere in between the two, I just gained a great understanding for their way of doing things, which prior to going to China, I didn't know how it worked. And it was a little intimidating because there's so much negativity in our media surrounding their government. So I gained compassion and understanding for the people and their way of doing things. So I had to press him a little further on this one. And he continued by giving me examples. And he said, what I was specifically referring to was the Communist Party's intention to enable the elite, most educated citizens access to the government by which they could make educated decisions and elect the best possible officials. Those elected elite then go on to elect the most elite amongst themselves, who then elect the most elite amongst themselves all the way until the head of Congress is elected. It's an ideal, but I think it expresses something unique. Chinese do have a clear hierarchy and that hierarchy is respected. We have the same hierarchy here in the United States, but I don't think it's respected as much as, as it's envied or even disdained. I respect how things get done from the top. It has its drawbacks as corruption is truly rampant, but the bureaucracy is seemingly less convoluted at the uppermost echelons. In the lower ranking circles, it's terrible. Okay, and then understanding, sorry, understanding character and moods. Um, one of the participants said, yeah, when I first got here, there was a lot of people, like people were always yelling. And I was like, are they angry? And I remember one time I spoke to a Chinese friend. She was teaching me Chinese and she said, no, actually just maybe there's too many people, so we have to speak up. And so I used to think people are always angry, but I think it, it has to do, it has to also do with heat in Wuhan. In the summertime too, it gets so hot and maybe people are just a little bit angry, but not like really angry, you know? They're just having a long day, a hot day, okay? 
So I think understanding that not everything is about you, realizing that not everything is personalized is important. Just the, the character, especially of people in Wuhan, which tends to be a little bit surly in, in certain areas, um, is something that one just accepts. And yeah, there are plenty of reasons for it. Um, and then understanding attitudes toward foreigners. So this came from someone who's lived in Wuhan for, I think, nine years now and is married to a Chinese national, just got married last uh, summer. And uh, he was feeling as though maybe he can never truly make this his home. And he said, I've always been of the opinion that this culture was very welcoming to all kinds of other foreigners. And that's still mostly true of the people. But one thing that always sticks in the back of my mind is that no matter how long I spend here or how involved in the society I become, I will never be Chinese. And they do have a very distinct line between Chinese and foreigners living here. So it's a little unsettling. When I first came here, I was like, oh yeah, this is awesome. And it was nice meeting all the foreigners here, but it's definitely weighed on me a little bit uh, that with the intention of building a life here or remaining here for a long period of time, you don't feel super secure. And you realize that politically, that at the drop of a hat, um, an immigration official could deny you an extension on your visa. So you're constantly living with that. You're living as a pawn between two governments. Somebody enters the other person, the other country's airspace and the common people pay for it, whether it's Chinese people here, American people here, something happens in the news, you're subject to people's prejudices, reactions, uh, government uh, decisions and so on. And then We'll talk about changes in the environment, the ever changing river that is China. Okay. Um, first, let's talk about the dissolution of romantic notions. So um, as you're in China, you realize that the environment that you're seeing is not quite the environment that you had expected. And so one student said something that I heard from several. I suppose some of my positive feelings were numbed a little bit, you know, some of the mystery, for example, it's not all Taoism and kids with ponytails lighting off fireworks. It's the real world. It's gritty. There's a lot of struggle, and I realize these things. The infrastructure, which grows more and more, and I will just briefly say as an aside, I started going to Wuhan in 2008, and when I would arrive at the airport, it would take about 45 minutes before I really saw buildings. Um, high rises. And the next time I went, it was 35 minutes and then it was 30 minutes. And then suddenly there were high rises backed up practically as far as the airport. So you have basically one hour of travel, which has become completely um, filled with with urban sprawl. And so this uh, student who's been in China for about eight years or nine says, I was constantly amazed by the scale of the economic machine here. And I was of the opinion that this can't last. This is unsustainable. This has to cave at some point. And being here for this long, you see that it's not just an anomaly. It's a way of life that's been building for a long time. OK, so we have this idea that growth can only last so long in the US. But in China, with 1.3 billion people, that growth continues and continues. And it is mind boggling as I'm sure most Americans would agree, just looking at this particular picture, okay? And there are a lot of those. Let's talk a minute about censorship and surveillance. Uh, the impression that sort of wasn't apparent upon arrival, so it wasn't a first impression, but it's something that people realized after a while. And one of the participants said, trying to do research where information is much more strictly controlled, at least what's put out officially, and with what they uh, let news outlets produce was frustrating because my first impression was in academia where we're all in this for the greater truth of learning. And I realized as well, this may be more difficult than I thought. And I kind of got my first taste of what it means to live in a place where they do restrict, restrict information like that, okay? Now, people have VPNs all over China. They're illegal, but they're also very common. But there's also something known as the Great Firewall in China, which 
um, sometimes makes it more and more difficult to use a VPN and people have to come up with, with different strategies for getting information from the outside. But that said, it's become more difficult in recent years um, to get information the way you could eight or 10 years ago. Um, censorship and surveillance. Um, this came from a student who was doing some teaching, and uh, this is me teaching a class in Wuhan um, at Huajong University of Science and Technology. Great kids. I have had some fantastic uh, audiences there. Um, but this is a student who'd been there for a bit longer, and he said, I never had anyone tell me what to say specifically, except for papers that I had written. They told me not to talk about certain things sensitive to China. But when I talked about certain issues in my class, we would have debates on certain issues. And I found that all of a sudden, students that I had never seen before were sitting in my class and spouting the party line. I asked some of my closer students in the class and they called them part-time spies, okay? And uh, finally, a student who had been in China for 11 years had this observation to share, which I thought was, was very interesting. He'd been there, I went there the, for the first time in 2009. So he said, well, my impression is, is that everyday Chinese people are still quite curious about the foreign world, but they were probably more so when I first arrived from like 2009 to 2012-ish. But I felt there's been a bit of a change in recent years where I wouldn't say that I felt unwelcome or that people were unfriendly, but the atmosphere felt a little colder to me. Towards the end of my stay in China, I felt a sense of confidence among the Chinese people where their country's at. Some changes in the government and things like that. So a little bit less open than before, I could say. Um, so there is a, a, a common phrase out called China number one, and people with the economic progress of China are beginning to feel more and more confident about being Chinese, about the Chinese government, and sometimes maybe a little bit less humble or a little less interested in looking toward the West for answers. So I think what he's been saying is essentially within that uh, thing that we call the change in the river are the change in the people that he would encounter. So with that, I bid you uh, thank you. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to to answer them.